Alberto will do the most dangerous and crazy trick in his life. Especially for you, dear viewers, he will get swallowed by a giant blue whale. Alberto goes to the North Atlantic. It's a vast area of water where you can meet blue whales and cachalots. He gets on a yacht and sails far from the shore. He's going to look for whales using echolocation and binoculars. A few days have passed. Alberto sits on board and studies the horizon. The sonar detects some movement. He looks toward the signal and sees a water fountain rising into the sky. It's a giant blue whale, the largest mammal on the planet. Yes, it's a mammal, not a fish. So, Alberto smears himself with oil to easily squeeze into the whale's throat. He takes an oxygen mask and jumps into the water. The blue whale opens its mouth and absorbs a massive amount of water. Its mouth is filled with whale bone. These are the bristles that replace teeth. They consist of keratin protein. People's hair and nails are made of it. The whale draws in water and then pushes it out. The bristles prevent small fish and plankton from leaving the mouth along with the liquid. Whalebone is like a filter. Alberto swims closer. The whale takes a sip. It absorbs several dozen gallons of water and sucks up Alberto. Our hero is inside the storm. The water splashes in different directions and a giant tongue the size of an elephant throws Alberto on different sides. Alberto tries to get to the throat, but the water splashes back out. Alberto slides along the tongue to the mouth's exit, but the whale closes his mouth and he crashes into the whalebone. It's a little painful. A couple of bristles even fall off. The tongue wants to push him out, but Alberto manages to squeeze into its throat. But here, he meets a block. He can't go further because of the structure of the whale. This colossal animal's throat is tiny, the size of a fist, but it can stretch. Alberto had foreseen this. That's why he smeared himself with oil. He stretches out to his full height and jumps into the throat. Now our hero finds himself inside a narrow esophagus. He slides on it like a slide in a water park. Then his speed decreases. The space becomes narrower. Now Alberto is crawling forward with difficulty. It's very slippery here, and Alberto can barely move. The esophagus contracts and pushes Alberto further. Now he's inside the stomach. It's dark, cramped, and smells awful. Alberto wants to light a match, but his pockets are entirely wet. And it's a bad idea to make a fire here. Firstly, there's almost no oxygen, which means no chance for a fire. Secondly, various chemical reactions occur inside the stomach, creating explosive gases. Alberto doesn't want that. He takes out a flashlight and examines the place. The walls of the stomach are narrow and constantly pulsating. Alberto can't stand up to his full height. He's knee deep in some liquid. He sees skeletons of fish, shipwrecks, supermarket baskets, DVDs, a lamp, and a Moby Dick book around him. No, that's not true, as you're unlikely to find anything interesting inside a whale's stomach. Maybe a plastic bottle or some small squid. By the way, a cachalot, unlike a blue whale, has a wide and long throat. This allows it to swallow large prey whole. Technically, it can swallow a human with one sip. Anyway, you can find many exciting things in the cachalot's stomach. Once, this creature swallowed a giant squid whole. The length of these squids can reach 46 feet. That's the size of a small bus. But the cachalot managed to swallow such prey thanks to the flexible structure of the squid's body. Okay, now let's get back to Alberto. There's a terrible smell in the whale's stomach. Plankton and small fish are digested in gastric juice. And, wait, why does it hurt so much? Alberto feels the stomach juice splitting his suit. Alberto tries to get up, but it's too crowded in here. He hits the stomach walls with his hands, but nothing happens. The stomach narrows and squeezes Alberto more and more. The juice irritates his skin. Alberto shouts and waves his legs in different directions. He wants to cause a gag reflex, but it doesn't work. Alberto is desperate, and he doesn't know what to do. It seems that this is his last adventure. He closes his eyes and takes a deep breath. Stop! A deep breath! Precisely! Alberto opens the oxygen tank and fills the stomach with fresh air. Now the whale begins to bloat and is filled with gas. 
The stomach is throbbing, the juice is foaming, and it seems a storm is coming. The walls contract so much that they squeeze Alberto out through the esophagus. Together with the remains of fish and juice, he moves forward. The esophagus is getting narrower. Alberto finds it hard to breathe, but he sees the light at the end of the tunnel. The whale spits him out. Alberto is alive. He's happy that he managed to escape such an adventure unharmed. He returns to the boat and sails to the shore. But wait a minute. What's that swimming by right now? It's a cachalot. What a stroke of luck. Alberto dives into the water again. He's heading straight for the mouth of this huge animal. The cachalot absorbs water. Several fish and an octopus get there along with Alberto. The cachalot pushes him with its tongue in different directions and swallows all the prey. The throat is wide enough and Alberto easily manages to get there. But there's another problem. Alberto is already in a very tight esophagus where he can hardly breathe. And he doesn't have an oxygen tank. Alberto feels like he's been wrapped tightly in duct tape. He can't do anything and there's no air here. He squeezes deep into the esophagus and feels that he is not alone here. In addition to the octopus, he feels the movements of large tentacles. Wow, it's a giant squid, and it seems it's still alive. Alberto shakes his whole body, but can't change anything. He loses consciousness. The stomach walls are pressing on his face. At this point, Alberto bites it. An earthquake begins. All that lay in the stomach comes out. Finally, Alberto is outside. A colossal squid swims away as far as possible. It seems it hasn't understood what happened to it. Our hero climbs onto the yacht. He's the happiest person on the planet right now. He starts the engine and heads to the shore. You must understand that Alberto's story is purely hypothetical. Of course, in reality, a whale wouldn't be able to swallow a human. Reports that a person ended up in a whale's stomach are overgrown with myths and legends. Yes, there were cases when people got into their giant mouths, but they didn't go through the throat. One day a diver got there, but he miraculously survived thanks to scuba diving equipment that helped him breathe. Another case occurred with people who were kayaking. When a humpback whale catches fish, it swims up to the surface with its mouth open. It's like a grid that rises from below. Those guys on the kayaks were too close and fell into the whale's mouth. Anyway, don't worry, a whale can't swallow you. It's impossible, but it is possible for a cachalot. The good news is that this is a rare animal. The probability of getting into its stomach is one in a billion. It's more likely that a meteorite will fall near you. Most people on Earth will never see a cachalot in real life. These animals swim worldwide in open oceans, but spend most of their time at a depth of about 10,000 feet. That's 10 times the height of the Eiffel Tower, but just in the ocean. Imagine crying out to someone not knowing that they can't hear you. This is the story of the loneliest whale swimming in the oceans. Scientists can only refer to the whale as a 52 hertz whale, or a 52 whale for short. They call it that because they picked up its sound pitch similar to a blue whale's frequency, which is between 10 and 39 hertz. Whales, like many animals, communicate with frequencies only they can understand. This whale in particular is known as the only one of its kind, since no other whale produces the same frequency. It's almost like a ghost since no one has ever seen this whale in person or through footage. We only have recordings via hydrophones. It's been swimming around for decades and was first heard in the late 1980s up until 2010. Scientists have been receiving the whale's cry in the Pacific Ocean yearly from August to December. Between January and February, it moves out of range. Scientists are still wrapping their heads around what this whale could be. Some are saying that it could be a blue whale hybrid of some kind, while others are suggesting that it could simply be a blue whale but with a special condition. Some think that the whale might not hear properly or cannot hear at all. But the fact that the blue whale has been around for such a long time means it's most probably a healthy whale. We know that the whale resides somewhere in the North Pacific, but scientists still haven't seen it for the past 30 years. All we've been doing is collecting vocal recordings through its path, calling for another whale to answer. 
people discovered whale frequencies by accident. The U.S. leadership deployed a bunch of hydrophones across the ocean floor to listen to other incoming submarines. While it may have proven successful for them, it also caught various frequencies from the depths of the oceans. Monstrous sounds. They described them as deep, rumbling calls. For centuries, legendary creatures were thought to have roamed the deep, dark waters. Krakens, leviathans, and other scary aquatic beasts. Maybe the submarines first thought they were listening to one of the creatures. But the frequencies were later identified as the sound of blue and fin whales. Towards the end of the 1980s, researchers and scientists were granted access to use the hydrophone network specifically for whales. Scientists realized that they could capture the frequencies of almost all whales, and just the 52 hertz stood out. There was so much buzz around this whale that some people decided to make a documentary about it. People have always wondered if this whale would ever find the special one it's always been calling for. The Megalodon was the biggest shark to ever live. Not only that, it's one of the biggest fish and the largest predator in Earth's history. Over three times longer than the biggest great white shark on record, the females have also been found to be twice the size of the males. The Megalodon could swallow a small car without even touching its teeth, if cars had been around then. In fact, the Meg was so big and powerful that it had no natural predators. It was the uncrowned king of the seas, swimming freely from ocean to ocean. This cosmopolitan creature was found all over the world from America to Europe and Australia and Japan, assuming there were countries back then. Meg fossils have been found on every continent except Antarctica. Everybody skips Antarctica. Science tells us that the Megalodon went extinct over 3.6 million years ago. But could they still be alive at the deepest depths of the ocean? The fearsome name, Megalodon, comes from two Greek words, megas, meaning big, and odont, meaning tooth. Combined, they mean big tooth, and it certainly lived up to its name. Just one of its chompers is the same size as a human head. It had 276 humongous teeth in total, across five terrifying rows. In all of history, only a couple of saber-toothed cats and the T-Rex had consistently bigger teeth. Now that's a showdown I'd like to watch. The Megalodon vanished millions of years ago, leaving only huge teeth to be found by modern archaeologists. Only around 80% of the ocean has been explored, so who knows what's lurking at the bottom. If you did manage to make it down, it's unlikely that you'll run into Meg, though. The sharks, like us, preferred warm coastal waters. Deep ocean living would be too cold for the beasts, and food would be scarce. Their entire bodies would also have to evolve to avoid being squished by the enormous water pressure down there. It's unlikely that they're still around, but not impossible. Now, about the appearance of the Megalodon. Scientists believe it didn't look like a great white shark. The Megalodon belongs to a different fish family and most likely looked like a giant sand tiger shark. Flattened snout, small eyes, its dorsal fin moved backward. The sand shark has two dorsal fins about the same size. The coloration is light brown with a white belly. It may have had brown red spots like a sand shark all over its body. We used to think of the megalodon as something scary from the first finds of its fossils. That was back in the Renaissance era. People found some teeth in the rocks. At first, these teeth were thought to be the tongues of dragons or snakes. And here is the first drawing of what the owner of these teeth supposedly looked like. A massive snout with a scary nose and a bunch of razor-sharp teeth. The megalodon is usually described as a sort of giant great white shark, but this is just a common myth. In fact, the ancestors of today's great white existed at the same time as the meg. But they weren't the best buddies and were even in competition with each other. The great white shark was a better hunter, using its smaller size and agility to snap up Meg's prey quickly. They were also known to eat Meg pups, who were only half their size. This didn't help the whole extinction thing. We also have evidence that megalodons were brutal hunters, kings of the food chain. The first combat tool in their arsenal was the battering ram. 
The Megalodon would take its prey by surprise. It had only one chance to hit it. If it missed, it would take too long for a second round. The maneuverability of the Megalodon was comparable to a large truck. While a great white was no match for an adult Meg in a head-to-head -head fight, they sure weren't scared of stealing their food. This only left the bigger fish and whales for the Meg. But its food supplies began to run out as the whales swam to the cooler new seas. The whales adapted to prefer the colder temperatures, leaving our friend the Meg behind. The Megalodons either starved or were frozen into extinction by the Ice Age. Rather than a great white, the Megalodon is more like a modern bull shark. It had a short snout, a flat lower jaw, and huge pectoral fins to support its massive weight and size. As scary as they are, these sharks were actually caring family guys. Several Megalodon nursery areas have been discovered in Florida, Maryland, and Panama. They gave birth to their young in shallow water environments. We know this from discovering loads of tiny Megalodon teeth found in these areas. I wonder if they had nannies too. But how come there are so many Megalodon teeth out there for us to analyze? Due to their messy, aggressive eating habits, sharks regularly lose their teeth. They lose a set of teeth every one to two weeks. That's 40,000 teeth in a lifetime. They must rake in a fortune from the tooth fairy. Because of this, their teeth were continually raining down to the ocean floor. Luckily for us, they're also the hardest part of the shark skeleton which is why so many teeth have survived and become fossilized. It's fair to say the first discoveries of the Meg's teeth confused people. Early discoverers thought that the Meg's teeth were petrified tongues of ancient serpent creatures. They even used to call them tongue stones. It's also a common myth that the Megalodon was around at the same time as the dinosaurs, although this would have been pretty cool. The dinosaurs were wiped out around 66 million years ago. But the megalodons came much later. The oldest meg fossil is only around 23 million years old, but it's tricky to pinpoint the exact date. After all, calendars weren't invented yet. They became extinct way before humans even evolved. The earliest Homo sapiens, which is a fancy name for the first humans, emerged about 2.5 million years ago. But what if the megalodon shark didn't go extinct? Whale populations have dropped drastically since these guys were last around, so there'd be way fewer whales for them to chomp down on. Whales have also gotten a lot smarter and learned new defensive moves, making them way harder to take down. It's estimated that they ate around 12 tons of food each day. 450 million years ago, no I wasn't around then, the sea level was higher, coral reefs started to form, the climate on our planet was stable and warm, not even dinosaurs were around yet. The time when bony and jawed fish we know as sharks appeared. They've been dominating the oceans and making other marine creatures flee in fear ever since. Many of them, like great white sharks, have evolved and adjusted to life in the open ocean as hunters with a pretty high position in the food chain. They're less diverse today than before. One of the reasons is the asteroid strike from the age of dinosaurs. After it reduced the number of shark species, only smaller and deep-water kinds that ate primarily fish survived. They started getting bigger over time. Near the surface, sharks such as makos or great white ones develop faster movements and are somewhat between gray and blue to blend in with their surroundings. The epaulet shark can even walk on the land. It can't take a walk on the beach because it can't breathe outside of the water. But it lives on coral flats in shallow tropical waters, so it can walk in kind of a crawling motion. But deep down below, there are mysterious alien-looking, often huge shark species that didn't come to the surface, which is why they didn't need to adjust to the new environment and different conditions. They haven't changed a lot through time, so they're some living fossils. These creatures mostly don't have five gill slits, the most common number, but six or seven. It's because there's less oxygen the deeper you go in the ocean, so they need more gill slits. Sharks on the surface evolved to have fewer gill slits. Six-gill sharks are the most primitive sharks we have today. Their skeletons are like those of ancient extinct sharks, and they can survive only in very deep waters. Like cats, sharks have a layer of reflective cells placed inside their eyes, which helps them see better in the dark deep sea or cloudy waters. Sharks on the surface have big eyes because they evolved to hunt in the sunlight, so they tend to rely on their vision. 
Those that live in shallow waters have small eyes, so they can protect themselves from the sand. Like some other deep-sea creatures, six-gill sharks also have bigger eyes to take in as much light as possible. They have more light-sensing rods, but don't distinguish colors that well. In the ocean's twilight zone, with the minimum of sunlight, there's a couple of bioluminescent shark species. They don't take in light within their eyes, but produce or re-emit it with their bodies. Their skin or organs have specialized cells that produce a soft blue-green light. Deep-sea creatures that produce their own light do that to attract their prey, deter animals from going after them, or, scientists think, communicate with each other. It can even help them to camouflage. They do it by hiding their silhouettes from animals going after them. They produce enough light to match their surroundings. The biggest luminous underwater creature is the kite fin shark. Found swimming 980 feet below sea level, preying on ground fish or smaller sharks. It can grow almost 6 feet long and lives 3,200 feet below sea level. Deep sea sharks are also bigger than those on the surface. The Greenland shark can grow up to 24 feet long, bigger than a great white. There's a thing called deep sea gigantism. Creatures in nutrient-poor depths of the ocean grow bigger because, that way, they lose less energy as heat. The Greenland shark lives its life in slow motion. It has a slow metabolism and can go very long periods without food. With their slow pace, they evolved to live up to 500 years at depths of 7,200 feet. Sharks in shallow waters catch their prey, relying on agility and speed. But for them, it's easier because there's plenty of food on the surface. Deep sea sharks, with less food and slower life rhythm, had to develop a different style. They're more opportunistic, definitely not picky, and don't care if their future meal is alive or not. Frilled shark, another living fossil from the darkest depths, hasn't evolved much through time. And they're one of the last of their kind, with all of their relatives already gone extinct. It grows up to 7 feet long, primarily hunts on squid, and catches other sharks and fish. It looks like a dinosaur, a snake-like face, a long, smooth, thin body that moves in a serpentine way. It can propel itself with the power of its tail and curl like snakes. They don't swim in a straight line like other sharks. Cookie-cutter shark grows up to 20 inches. It got the name because of the way it feeds, biting off small pieces. It's a parasite creature, which means it feeds off bigger animals but leaves them alive. They have sharp teeth and sometimes even swallow those that fall off on purpose. Some researchers think it could be because they live in the depths that are nutrient-poor. If they swallow the teeth, they could recycle calcium and other material from it. Prickly shark is a rare and unusual creature with many thorn-like denticles and two small dorsal fins. It lives mostly in the depths of the Pacific region up to 1,900 feet. Ghost sharks are not even real sharks, but fish closely related to them and rays. They have big pectoral and pelvic fins, two dorsal fins, pretty big eyes, and unlike their cousins, have a single external gill opening. Ghost sharks have slender tails and can grow up to 80 inches, silver to blackish color. They sometimes live in rivers and coastal waters, but also in the depths of the ocean of 8,200 feet or even deeper. They are pretty weak swimmers, so they tend to feed on invertebrates and small fish. Goblin sharks. Swimming through the deep sea, this creepy shark with a flabby body suddenly sees a small, innocent squid. It goes toward it, but the potential snack notices it and quickly starts moving to dart away. It seems like the plan could work at first, but then the shark suddenly thrusts the jaw of its mouth and catches the poor little squid in a second. After the meal is finished, the animal simply fits the jaw back into the mouth and goes away as if nothing happened. This is possible because it has a jaw connected to 3-inch long flaps of skin, which is why it can unfold from the snout. It can grow up to 12 feet long with a weight of 460 pounds. Scientists think goblin sharks are mostly active in the morning and evening. The shark has a long, prominent snout and specific sensing organs on it. It uses them to sense electrical fields in the dark oceanic depths. Seven-gill shark is a big cow shark, brown to silver-gray on top, white underneath, black and white spots, with a thick body, a small dorsal fin, and a wide, blunt snout. 
It can grow up to 10 feet long, mostly lives in the depth of 1,870 feet, but you can also find it in deep channels and bays. It can be aggressive toward humans if provoked, so don't. Like most deep-sea creatures, it's an opportunistic hunter that's not quite picky but likes to go after dolphins, seals, porpoises, and other marine animals. Megamouth sharks mostly live in the depths of 15,000 feet and spend most of their time in the dark, like me. Scientists discovered it in 1976 because it went near the surface at night to feed on zooplankton. That's the only time these sharks go there. During the day, they return to their quiet, dark, and mysterious depths. They are filter feeders, which means they keep their mouths wide open while swimming, so they filter the planktons they like to eat. There are organs that produce light inside of their mouths, which attracts potential prey, such as pelagic crustaceans. These sharks live in the deep parts of the ocean, but you can rarely find them below almost 2 miles. Scientists think some other, stronger bony fishes outcompeted them. Deep parts of oceans became oxygenated around 70 million years ago, and sharks have been around way longer. But bony fishes adjusted and adapted efficient ways to use oxygen, while sharks were slow with adaptations, so they lost. Also, oceanic depths are way colder, which is challenging for fish and the rest of cold-blooded animals because the speed of their metabolism widely depends upon the external temperature. Some sharks have an eerie ability to spit out their stomach and then pull it back into place. Well, that would be handy. Most sharks eat huge amounts of food, but the problem is they can't digest everything they've gulped down. So they need a way to get rid of such stuff as sea turtle shells and beaks, bird feathers and bones, lobster claws and whatnot. And then these amazing creatures willingly barf up their whole stomach, along with all the contents. After the shark is done, it pulls its main digestive organ back in. And the entire process usually takes no more than a second. Some shark species, like great whites or mako, have a special eye-warming system. Their retina heats up their eyes and brain. This not only helps them detect movement better, but also improves resolution. As for the mako shark, this species often travels vertically across different temperatures. Unlike most people with only one movable jaw, sharks can freely move both their lower and upper jaws. This allows them to get a better grip on their meal and chew it up faster and more thoroughly. That's comforting. Sharks give birth to a large number of little ones at once. It depends on the species, of course, but let's say the blue shark is famous for producing more than 130 pups at a time. Great white sharks have a more powerful bite than most jungle cats. A 20-foot-long underwater hunter can produce a force of more than 4,000 pounds per square inch. And that's a bite four times stronger than that of a lion or tiger. People with their measly 150 to 200 psi bites aren't in the running whatsoever. Swell sharks defend themselves by swallowing huge amounts of water. Then the shark's body becomes twice its normal size, and this scares potential danger away. Sharks can grow more than 50,000 teeth during their lifetime, but not all of their teeth are the same. The strongest and most massive ones are at the front, and those closer to the back are smaller and not so powerful. But if the front teeth are damaged, these weaker ones can replace them. It's possible because sharks' teeth aren't as deeply rooted as humans and can move. Shark skin has the same feel as sandpaper. It's made of teeny, teeth-like scales. They point towards the animal's tail. This helps to reduce the friction that occurs when sharks move through the water. Whale sharks have extremely thick skin. In some places on their body, it can be 6 inches thick. It's one of the toughest in the animal world. Scientists have to make loads of effort if they want to get this creature's blood sample. Sharks have an incredible sense of smell. But besides that, they use one more sense to detect other animals. There are special pores around their head, near the nostrils, and under the snout. Those are special organs, something like second sight. Every creature generates a tiny electrical field. Thanks to the pores, sharks can spot these electrical fields and figure out where other animals are. Sharks are incredibly sharp-eared. They can hear their potential meal from 3,000 feet away. They can also catch low-frequency sounds, like the ones produced by a fish's contracting muscle tissue. Sharks have been around for more than 400 million years. It means they've lived through four out of five mass extinctions. 
This makes them way older than Mount Everest, humans, dinosaurs, and even trees. These creatures go back to the period when coral reefs were just beginning to form. Some shark species can jump out of the water, like the great white shark or the basking shark. They're known to leap from more than 8 feet up into the air. Thanks to this maneuver, they can catch such animals as seals or seabirds. But unless you're in South Africa, you aren't likely to see sharks jumping out of the water. Shark skeletons are made of muscle and cartilage, which are lighter and twice less dense than bones. This makes sharks more flexible, which allows them to make sharp turns when they're chasing other animals. Hammerhead sharks have a weirdly shaped head for a reason. Thanks to it, these creatures have incredible 360-degree vision. Their eyes are tilted a bit forward, and it allows them to have an overlapping field of view. The goblin shark's terrifying jaws are attached to elastic ligaments. They can unfold from the animal's snout for up to 3 inches. It allows the animal to catapult its mouth forward to catch other marine creatures. Sharks don't sleep as you do. Some species have to keep swimming all the time. Otherwise, water will stop flowing through their gills and they won't be able to breathe. Others do rest, but they don't enter an unconscious state. They just go into special rest periods. These creatures don't have eyelids. That's why their eyes remain always open and their pupils monitor their surroundings. They also keep their mouth open so that the water can pass through their gills. Sharks can travel remarkably long distances without needing any rest all thanks to their bizarre sleeping pattern. For example, great whites can swim distances of more than 2,000 miles without stopping to eat or rest. How come these creatures don't starve? They draw on the fat stored in their livers. By the way, this organ can compose up to a third of the animal's body weight. Contrary to popular belief, sharks do not and cannot swim in reverse. Their tails propel them forward, and their pectoral fins help them to keep their balance and turn. It means that, anatomically, these animals can't move in any direction other than forward. Sharks have no vocal cords. They can't produce sounds to communicate with one another or express their emotions. That's why they have to use body movements, like twisting their bodies or flipping over. Sharks live in all of the world's oceans, but several species also inhabit freshwater rivers and lakes. For instance, bull sharks have been found in tropical rivers. They're also known to be able to swim between fresh and salt water. The smallest shark out there is the dwarf lantern shark. This unique creature doesn't grow longer than 8 inches. But the shark makes up for its tiny size in other ways. For example, some of its organs emit light. And since the creature lives in the shallow waters, this helps to camouflage it in the rays of sunlight. Blue sharks eat a lot often more than they need. Some of this food can remain undigested for weeks till it's needed for energy. Sharks have something that looks similar to a tongue, but this organ is called the bashil. It's the front section of the cartilage that goes from the shark's chest to its mouth. It doesn't move and is pretty much useless. This so-called tongue doesn't take part in the process of feeding. It isn't covered in taste buds. Its only real use might be that it supports some of the bones connecting the shark's gills. There are hundreds of shark species in the world, more precisely, around 500. Some of them are pretty bizarre. Just look at the goblin, basking, or cookie-cutter shark. All these sharks vary in size, from several inches to dozens of feet long. They also live in absolutely different environments. Tiger sharks eat whatever they can get their jaws around. Some of the weirdest things they've munched on are video cameras, bags of money, license plates from almost any U.S. state, dog leashes, <laughs> you name it. Each whale shark has a unique pattern on its skin. These spots and stripes can be used to identify individual sharks, just like fingerprints are used to identify people. The blunt-nosed six-gill shark can dive to a depth as great as five Empire State Buildings. Baby sharks are called pups. When they get born or hatch, they are already fully nourished. And if they choose to swim away from their mama shark, they don't need to hunt for food for at least several weeks. Uh-oh, did somebody say baby shark? So you're swimming two miles down at the bottom of the ocean. Don't ask me how, just play along. It's cold and the pressure is intense. No fish in sight. Then you notice a green shiny thing. It's a cookie-cutter shark. 
Its neck glows in the dark to attract fish and other delicious treats. The shark doesn't look like much. It's small, about the size of a cat. It has brown skin and large green eyes. But looks can be deceiving. Every night, this creature rises to the surface and goes after great white sharks, whales, even swordfish. If you look closely, you'll see a round mouth with a bunch of sharp teeth in it. They don't just bite, they work kind of like a saw. This one's called a cookie-cutter shark because when it sees something delicious, it takes a cookie-shaped bite out of it. These sharks have even been known to disable submarines. Wonder what flavor they are. Our next shark is about the length of a car. Only about a hundred of these sharks have ever been seen, but if you met one, you'd never forget it. It has a big mouth, a huge mouth, a mega mouth, like me! It's the mega mouth shark. You could easily fit in it if you curled yourself up. They're not dangerous, though. Not to humans. They feed by swimming around with their mouths open, filtering out plankton and other underwater goodies. The shark has special organs in its mouth that glow, attracting little crustaceans. It swims deep in the ocean in total darkness. Probably has a great smile, though. Thresher sharks also have a huge body part, the tail. It's almost half the length of the shark itself, and it looks like a helicopter blade. It's one of the few animals that hunts using its tail. The shark sneaks up on a school of fish and starts to shake its moneymaker. This freaks out some of the fish, which is exactly the plan. In a pinch, it can also use its tail to defend itself. The best thing about this shark? It doesn't attack people. The angel shark. There are quite a few types of angel shark out there, but they're more shark than angel. They're flat like stingrays, and their skin is covered with patterns that help them blend in with the seafloor. Because of this disguise, divers sometimes accidentally touch them, which isn't the best idea. They're fast and have powerful jaws. Still, they prefer the taste of small fish to you. The horn shark has two ridges that look like horns right above its eyes. It's definitely the grandpa of the shark world. Not aggressive, swims pretty slowly, and is up late almost every night. Its two favorite meals, sea urchins and crustaceans. It moves its fin on the seafloor almost as if it had paws. But don't underestimate this guy. It has one of the strongest bites of any shark. It needs those strong teeth to crush the shells of its late-night meals. And if something tries to attack it, watch out! Horn sharks have sharp spikes on their fins. The award for the ugliest shark goes to the goblin shark. And it's not even close. From the outside, it already looks kind of weird and is about the size of a pink underwater motorbike. It has a long tail and a seriously long nose. It lives way down in the depths of the ocean and loves to eat squid. It's not as fast as its relatives, but it's way more sneaky. It has a secret squid-catching technique, which is totally wild. The shark swims behind the squid. It's catching up, getting closer and closer. But the squid isn't slowing down, no way! It looks like the poor goblin shark won't have any lunch today. Then it opens its mouth. Its jaw is attached to folds of skin that mean it can literally throw its jaw out of its mouth. And it's a shark, so those teeth are sharp. That extra reach helps it grab its lunch, and when the meal's over, it pops its jaw back in its mouth. These sharks have been seen many times off the coast of Japan. They're actually named after the goblins in Japanese myths and fairy tales. There's only one thing out there cooler than a ninja shark. It's the ninja lantern shark. Imagine there's a tube you can slide down that takes you to the bottom of the ocean. It's too dark, you can't see anything. Suddenly, a glowing dot, moving around in the distance. It's coming closer, shooting towards you. It's a blue glowing head. Worse, it looks like this head doesn't have a body attached to it. The ninja lantern shark has black skin, so it's almost invisible in the dark. It's only the size of a human arm, but its small, sharp teeth are no joke. No one really knows why this shark glows. Maybe to attract tasty fish? Another theory out there is that it uses this light to communicate with its friends. It has friends? The hammerhead shark. These ferocious sharks can weigh up to half a ton. 
They live in tropical waters all over the world, and they're one of the most recognizable sharks out there. Their eyes really are located on the sides of their hammerhead. This means they can see in almost all directions. They even have special neck muscles to lift their head up and down just to see that little bit better. Their favorite food? Stingrays. You know, those flat things that swim along the seafloor, camouflage to look like sand and bits of rock. Stingrays get by by blending in with their surroundings. Danger mostly just swims by. But the hammerhead's eyes see everything. Uh Uh-oh. Great white sharks, hammerheads, and other large sharks live for about 25 years. But one shark can live much, much longer. The Greenland shark can live anywhere from 300 to 500 years. It lives mostly in the North Atlantic and Arctic oceans. It loves to swim deep down where it's dark, so it uses its nose to sniff out food. Since it spends so much time down there, it's figured out how to withstand the strong pressure. It's one of the oldest living, largest, and slowest fish on Earth. Just imagine, you're on an Arctic cruise and you see one of these sharks moving slowly through the freezing cold water. It might be 400 years older than you. Most sharks are omnivorous. They can go after dolphins, other sharks, crabs, sea urchins, smaller or even larger fish, hot dogs. Eh, kidding about the hot dogs. But the bonnethead shark is a bit different. It eats algae for about half its meals. It's actually related to the hammerhead shark, but its head looks more like a shovel. Can you dig it? If you see this guy swimming around, you might think it's a sea snake or a huge water worm. Frilled sharks like to swim way down at the bottom of the ocean, like a lot of sharks. When they're chasing something delicious, they move kind of like a snake. And just like a snake, they like to gulp down their lunch all in one piece. But that doesn't mean they don't have teeth. They have about 200 nice and sharp ones. The saw shark has a long, flat, and seriously spiky nose. Those teeth on its nose never stop growing. Each tooth is equipped with electric receptors to help the saw shark feel around for nearby fish, like a ship's radar. When dinner's nearby, the shark swims up and strikes with its nose, waving it around like a knight showing off his skills. Meanwhile, you won't have time to blink if this guy floats past. Did you see it? How about now? Meet the fastest shark in the world, the short fin mako shark. It can swim up to 35 miles per hour. That doesn't seem that quick on land, but underwater, that's fast. Slower than a cheetah, but faster than most dogs. It's warm-blooded, which is super rare for a shark. That helps it swim to cold and distant places where an ordinary shark simply wouldn't survive. The swordfish goes much faster. It can swim up to 60 miles per hour. It's not a shark, but it's still an amazing creature. In a race, the swordfish will usually come out on top. But it's not just fast, it's ingeniously fast. It has a gland next to its nose that pumps out a special oil. This oil spreads through its nose and comes out through tiny holes. This special oil is waterproof, which lets the swordfish glide through the water at high speed.